Good morning. Welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. It's a busy day aboard the International Space Station today. I have a very special guest who knows all about that kind of work that takes place. They're all place. busy days. <laughs> They're all busy days. It, it, I feel like I'm doing a sports cast here. Um, so, uh, as I said, we have a very special guest with, here with us today who knows all about those busy days aboard the International Space Station, three-time space flyer, most recently Expedition 28 and 29, where he served as commander of the space station. Yep. And uh, here he is, NASA astronaut Mike Fossum. Welcome. Hey, Amico. It's great to be with you back on uh, NASA TV today. Yes. Welcome, as always. And uh, we always love to have you here. So. As I mentioned, let's just get right into it, because sure. there's a lot of work that's um, going on aboard the International Space Station. Some activity um, took place on yesterday. Right. Yesterday, early morning, we had a Progress, Progress 49, that departed the space station. I know you guys received and uh, saw vehicle, oh, cargo vehicles coming and going. So talk to me a little about what your role is on these vehicles when, well, and the, when the they come The Progress is a cargo ship that the Russians launch uh, from Kazakhstan, from their uh, launch uh, facility there. Uh, it, the rocket itself is very much like the Soyuz rocket that we fly, uh, and, but instead of the people on top, you have the, the uh, cargo ship on top called Progress. Uh, and it's loaded with uh, you know a thousand pounds or so of equipment, supplies, everything from clothes, running shoes, food, to uh, to new pieces of equipment, either to install new experiments on board or uh, just replacement parts for the care and, care and feeding and maintaining of the space station. Okay. Get all that good stuff off over the course of a few weeks as you kind of go burrowing in. Of course, the best thing's right on top. They always put some fresh fruit. So you open the hatch and right, you know, very quickly you get to the fresh oranges, bananas, apples. Uh, actually, not bananas. I, no, I have seen bananas. Those, those are a little harder. Those are the first, I bet. Yeah, they, you eat those first. And, and, uh, and even some uh, onions and garlic to have wow. a little bit of fresh stuff uh, on board. Once you get it emptied out, uh -huh. then it's time to start filling it back up. And so that's how we take out the trash, is to fill these kind of cargo ships up with uh, all of the things you need to get rid of. We can't just uh, We can't just open a hatch and throw it out. We use these cargo ships, and they, the Progress cargo ship burns up on its way back into the atmosphere, and so you pretty much incinerate everything. Okay, great. I think we're looking at video now from this morning, I mean, not this morning, but yesterday morning, right. uh, departure from the International Space Station. Um, the uh, Progress backs away, fires its thruster, and back, backed away to a safe distance. It actually has not deorbited yet. I understand Progress 49 is, they're going to be doing some radar system testing. Right. Um, for over the next few days, I believe, on the uh, 21st, beginning on the 21st, and then on the 26th, we'll deorbit in it all. You bet. Beyond, the, the view we'll we have right now is a little confusing because that's actually the view from the progress. As it has a camera that looks at the station, and that's used particularly for the docking, but also for the undocking. And so the view that we had there was of the space station as the progress is backing away. Okay. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I think even from that camera view, sometimes when we're seeing the docking or the undocking, you can actually see the crosshairs of you where bet. they're lining up. Oh yeah, up when you get in close, mechanism. you can see that. So. Okay. Great. And so let's talk about a, a few other of the cargo ships and also just the importance of those cargo supply ships. Right. So what other cargo supply ships well, do we ATV, have? the uh, ATV, it's a, a Russian uh, cargo, or I'm sorry, it's a European-built cargo ship that we've had uh, s uh, several on board. Um, that I, the next one's due in a month or so. I've actually lost track of exactly when that's due. It's a very large ship um, that comes up again with a, with a large amount of supplies and a large capacity for hauling things away. Um, and we have the, um, uh, the, the SpaceX uh, Dragon. Yep. Uh, we've had several of those dock. And uh, what makes the Dragon unique is that the, uh, the, the Dragon spaceship actually re-enters uh, using a heat shield and is recovered. And so that's our way right now of getting the largest amount of things back to the Earth. And so we're returning some of the scientific experiments that we're doing on board require us to prepare samples, whether it's biologic samples from humans uh, or, or uh, materials samples from things we process in furnaces and stuff like that. And so now with the SpaceX Dragon, we can get those samples back to Earth. Uh, the other cargo ship is the HTV, uh, um, which is a, a Japanese-built cargo ship, and it works pretty much the same as the Progress and the ATV. I know the acronyms get confusing. <laughs> so it burns up on the way in. 
and we're very close. Uh, Orbital Sciences Corporation is very close to launching their first rocket tomorrow afternoon at about 4 o'clock Central Time. Yep. We're all uh, waiting with a great anticipation for that event, and they're close to uh, launching their next, uh, their first Cygnus resupply ship to the station also. So okay. there's uh, quite a number of, of different ships and options that we have. And uh, so, and very important, obviously, to talk about those capa the capabilities of those vehicles and the cargo craft that's coming. Let's talk a little about the capability of the space station itself. Sure. Um, I think the number one is uh, science on the space station. And uh, today, there's been a lot of, uh, actually all week, there's been a lot of activity on science experiments, um, one of which uh, Tom Marshburn has been working on with most of the day, and one that you are familiar with. This, these are those bowling ball sized <laughs> satellites. There are three different color orbs no, uh, spheres spheres and, and I, I i apologize i don't remember the acronym we just know it as spheres and they're a long large. one they're synchronize position hold engage reorient oh very right? good <laughs> they're large they're about the size actually a little bigger than a bowling ball they're about the size of a basketball uh and it's uh, it's a cooperative effort um and these 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 uh these spheres they, they're actually we call them satellites and they can maneuver inside the station, not throughout the whole station. They they require kind of a positioning system, and we have to set these uh, these sensors up inside the uh, module. And we usually use the Japanese laboratory, and uh, and then the the, the the individual satellites this can can determine their location. They can determine the location of the other free-flying satellites, and they can do things like maneuver around each other. It's actually kind of strange once you get these things set up, and there's a lot of work to get them set up. They sure. use just CO2, carbon dioxide, little thrusters, okay. just uh, compressed gas to, uh, to to maneuver around. But as you, as you turn them loose, get them activated, and they come up and they go through Different kinds of maneuvers, and they're for practice. We're, we're, it, it, we use it as a tool for. I mean, it's it's hardcore science, but it's also it, it's also used by uh, uh, students, and they have student competitions where they okay. program them to do certain maneuvers, and then they're evaluated based on how precise they were able to. The students were able to direct the satellites right. to do the maneuvers. What a cool project it, for students to looks, work on. It, it's, it looks cool. It sounds cool. It would be great as, as a person here on Earth <clears throat> being able to see my project up there on Space Station and you guys working with it. Absolutely. Moving right along because we have a lot to talk you about bet. here. Um, so Cassidy was working earlier with the uh, combustion integrated rack and, and just explain what that facility is and what it serves. Well, the, there's we have several different combustion facilities in, on board. The combustion integrated rack has a has a, uh, a burn chamber, a combustion chamber down inside the rack, where we use different uh, different fuels, and we can actually control the atmosphere that's in the combustion chamber. And we're looking very detailed physics of the flame of combustion, uh, with a lot of. Uh, uh, sensors peering through these special quartz glass windows to to uh, to gather information about that because things burn differently in zero g, and without the the effects of gravity, the hot air rising, then we can we can study what's called the boundary uh, the, the boundary equations for flame, and you're really getting into the chemistry and the physics as they all come together to try to understand the borders that are right at the edge of combustibility. Will it burn? Will it not burn? What are the the physics, what are the optics, what are the signatures that it gives off when it's burning. Okay. That's in the combustion integrated rack. <clears throat> and they're also working in the in the microgravity science yeah, club box. I was gonna ask, this is the thing that you actually see them put their hands right. in, and you I think Cassidy was working with that one on a yet another, play, speaking of playing with fire, we're actually looking we're at a looking live view here. We're looking at live video right now. Of uh, another experiment known as the BAS, the burning and suppression um, experiment. So, can you talk well, to me a little about this? Well, this is looking at more, at, at, instead of the exotic fuels, this is looking at more common things, including things that we have on board the spacecraft, things that, that, that we use to build the panels out of, the clothing, um, and uh, and other equipment. And what we're looking at is the is again, we're looking at the details of of the combustion because we find in in the zero gravity environment, things burn differently. Now, one of the one of the applications of this is actually it goes into smoke detector uh, design because the smoke detectors that we have in our homes have all been optimized based on certain assumptions for 
uh, combustion products. What does a fire give off? It, because those smoke sensors don't measure the fire. They're measuring the smoke and the gases that come off of that fire and find their way to the smoke sensor or smoke detector. And so we're in, and so the ones on the space station, the ones we've used in space historically have been based on Earth type of measurements for, for combustion products. And so we're we're now looking to to see what the differences might be in the in in the in the different kind of combustion situations, very controlled in a glove box where you can control it very carefully. Yeah. Th to understand that better. And uh, and obviously um, for safety reasons that has some applications not only there in space but also here on Earth. So per perhaps we can have some find some advancements in uh, detection and suppression of fires. Absolutely. As well here. Absolutely. Anna. Very good. Well, leading into. You, uh, Fires is, an, is a topic of Earth Day, um, but uh, this has some. We have some uh, several other little things that we can talk about as far as Earth, and and how the space station um, relates to Earth Day. Earth mm -hmm. Day is a very important day for us here on Earth, obviously, <laughs> and as well as aboard the International Space Station. Earth Day is coming up on the 26th, uh, 22nd, and uh, we. Uh, Although here, we, I think we tend to take the whole month as Earth Day. So, first of all, talk to me a little about Earth Ops, because everybody wants to know about the photos and the pictures that you take, and they're lovely and beautiful, but why do we? Why are we so interested in seeing our Earth from the International Space well, Station? The, the value is getting, the, getting humans up there to, to look back at the Earth from a different point of view, because you can see things differently. Uh, you can see things in perspective that you can't see necessarily uh, when you're up close uh, on the ground. And a good example was a couple of years ago, I was on orbit when we had a lot of fires across the United States, particularly yeah. in the state of Texas. And we could see these individual fires and, 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 and you could even name some of them you know, by just knowing the, the geography and I, you know, and knowing that that's Bastrop, and I recognize the Bastrop area and and the fire that was there, but you also see, I mean, the the, the plumes from these fires that are all joining together and and actually flowing out uh, across the Gulf of Mexico, and so you could see the smoke haze that was actually influencing other people, and they had no idea where this haze was coming from. We could see that that's happening. You can see that uh, very frequently in other areas too, uh, in, in on the continent of Africa and even in Australia, where some of these wildfires are pretty uh, extensive. And you can see where the, the effects of those go a thousand miles downwind, as you can see that. Same for dust storms. It gives you the appreciation of seeing the Earth from above and how fragile it really is. And to look at the horizon, and we think atmosphere, you know, a little bit of stuff in the air, it's not a big deal. When you get up there and you, you realize you can put your arm out and the atmosphere is about half the thickness of your little finger because you could see it. And that's, you know, you realize that's a pretty small shell. We think of the atmosphere as, as being so extensive and um, it, it's not, it's really not. There's mm -hmm. a, it's a thin layer around this planet. And so, you know, these things always come back and there's, you can't just do something here and make a big difference. We all need to do it together. Right, right. So this leads me to, we had asked uh, some folks out on social media uh, to send us okay. your questions, and so they have a few questions for you. Good. And one of them relates much of what you were just talking about. This one comes on uh, to us on Facebook from Kirk, using the ECLIS, this is the Environmental Control Life Support System, to sustain life and looking at the Earth from aboard ISS. I would be interested to hear your personal opinion about your our planet's environment. Okay, well, it, it, Kirk, that's a it, great question. Uh, on board the station, well, on, on the planet, we have natural systems that you know take care of us in so many different ways. Uh, we have plants that give off the oxygen that we need, and at the same time, they absorb the carbon dioxide that's one of our waste products. Our, our water is purified, wastes find their way in, we try to purify them, but event, eventually they really get purified by evaporating, collecting in clouds, coming down in rain, and then we have fresh water that gathers in rivers and lakes and that we draw from for our drinking water. So in two real simple things, those kind of systems, uh, you know, those processes don't work on board the space station. We'd need huge modules full of plants to absorb enough carbon dioxide and give us enough, enough oxygen. And so we have to come up with systems that can replicate the Earth's natural systems to do it in a much more, uh, in a, uh, and take up a lot less space 
and do it in a, in a controlled way, in a reliable way. And so we're learning, you know, how to do those kind of things, you know, on board the station with systems that do all of the above, including purifying the water right. to, because uh, we, we can't afford to drink water one time right. and then throw it away. Right. We have to get it, re, uh, you know, purify, separate it out, and uh, recover as much as we can. So living aboard the International Space Station is teaching a lot of these, uh, teaching us a lot of these things that w we may need to use here on Earth to help us. It, it, it does give us the opportunity. They, we're learning a lot in how to, particularly the water purification area, sure. that we can uh, that we can use, and it's starting to show up in disaster relief and third world countries and things like that. And uh, you really, when we talk about spaceship, space station being a spaceship, and we need to do this. We're on spaceship Earth too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so like I said, tons of activity happening. This mm -hmm. Friday we have an EVA. This is a spacewalk. It's going to be a Russian spacewalk with Vinogradov and uh, a Romanenko. Mm -hmm. And do you can you tell sure. talk to us a yeah, little bit about we're, that? Yeah, it, we're it's uh, it, the the crew looks forward to doing uh, the spacewalks because it's a chance to uh, to to do something very challenging. Uh, and step outside and do some work. Um, there, the, for this particular one, the biggest one is installing a new experiment, uh, uh, aspects of a new experiment on the outside of the Russian part of the space station. They're going to do a little maintenance, and they're going to remove a few things that are uh, no longer needed and quite literally throw them away, literally, by throwing them. And uh, in a controlled way, throw them so they're going a little slower than the space station, and they'll drop out of orbit in, uh, within a few weeks. Wow. And uh, this, I, I, I've lost track now of how many spacewalks Pavel Vinogradov has. Right. He's, um, he's a very experienced, uh, uh, very experienced space flyer and space walker. Uh, it's going to be uh, fun to watch him as he teaches the new guy, the rookie. Right. As are you. I think you know something about that. You've done seven right. spacewalks, so you bet. with three three uh, space flights under the belt. I have a question here that came to us um, from Twitter. It comes from Irish Space Blog. He says, "Mike, does the view of Earth from Cupola differ?" greatly from the view during an EVA. Wow. You know, I think the biggest difference is even when you're in the cupola, you know you're you're up against windows. It's yes. really cool, uh, you know, to be able to do that, to see the Earth, to see the horizons, because most of the windows on the space station look straight down. And as you're passing over things at five miles a second, as you're trying to get a photo or just appreciate the view, it's kind of coming and then it's gone. And so it's, um, it happens fairly quickly. In the cupola, you can see that horizon and stuff. Um, outside, it it's, uh, can be almost overwhelming at times because instead of looking through um, you know, panes of glass, multiple panes of glass that are inches thick, you're looking through a fishbowl you know, that's on your head. Right. And you're out there and you can see around and, and really see the entire space station, which you, you don't get the chance to see through the other windows and see the Earth in its magnificence as it's kind of rolling by underneath you. Oh, well, I'm sure it's a true honor to be able to oh, be one is. of the people who actually get to go and venture outside the uh, space station. So, it, it, Yes, it is. I mean, it, it, it is an honor. It, it's, sure. uh, it's not all fun. Right. It's a lot of work, and uh, it's a little bit scary out there, even after you know, seven spacewalks, about 48 hours working right. outside. Well, this just brings me to one other question we received on uh, Twitter. This one comes from Amanda Hanna. She wanted to know, is it fun to do a spacewalk? And what did you do on your EVA, knowing that you did seven? Maybe we okay. can talk about the la last one. Okay. Well, Amanda, it's it's fun, but it's not all fun. And I think that that's really important to understand. It's, it's, uh, it's serious work. It's dangerous work. It's probably the most dangerous thing we do besides launch and landing. Uh, because there's risks associated with being outside in your own spaceship. In this case, their space suit has to collect that carbon dioxide, provide your oxygen, provide your cooling, and all those kind of things. Uh, it's uh, mentally challenging. It's physically challenging. You train a lot for it. Uh, and so it's, it's very personally rewarding to go out and to be able to do that. Uh, but there's, it, it's also a little scary out there, so you need to hang on. You need to double, triple check those safety tethers and uh, make sure that uh, you're following the procedures and you're not getting careless or too comfortable. So I say you're always a little scared. I think that's a good thing. Uh, my last spacewalk was during uh, uh, STS-135, the last space shuttle mission. And our job there was to take a, um, a, a pump module that had failed on the space station. And this is a 1,400-pound pump module. Didn't weigh that, this but it still the, has that This mass. was the, fun, the last space shuttle uh, Space last space the, shuttle mission. During space right. mo shuttle mission. And so were you with the... I was living on board the station, and when the uh, space shuttle Atlantis came up with her crew, 
and then Ron Guerin and I were right. the expedition crew members that did the spacewalk. Right. We moved a, the pump module. It was an ammonia pump part of the space station's cooling system that had failed a couple of years before that. We moved that and put it in the payload bay of the, uh, of the spatial Atlantis so they could bring it back for analysis. And we moved a new experiment, uh, remote refueling mission. Uh, it was a Goddard experiment that was brought up in the space shuttle and we moved that, placed it on the outside of the station. And then uh, the robotically it was moved to its, uh, its position on the, on the truss of the station where they've been doing uh, ongoing experiments with that, uh, with that Goddard payload and it's very exciting to see them doing that. Okay, and also real quick, um, this one's gonna be a Russian spacewalk and so I know um, that at times we use uh, some of our U.S. equipment on their sure. spacesuits for their spacesuits. Hatfield was installing the lights on their Olan suits, mm -hmm. and uh, Cassidy was configuring the cameras. Can you talk to me about some of what your role is, if if you were not sure. on a spacewalk and it was the Russian? Well, side? just supporting the other uh, the other crew members, and I supported a Russian uh, spacewalk while I was up there too. Um, we set them up, uh, and, and in this case, uh, Roman Romanenko will be wearing a, a helmet camera that's a U.S. helmet camera will be mounted on his suit so we'll be able to watch him as he's working. There's several different tools that we that we share and and so kind of set him up. I helped the crew some with uh, with some of their fit checks and had some ideas um, for uh, you know for helping them out. The, the uh, U.S. crew members will also be kind of assisting as they close the hatches and, and they their airlock system works just a little differently than ours and uh, our guys will be supporting some of the pressure checks to make sure that the hatches uh, none of the hatches associated with that are leaking. Okay. So Very good. It'll well, be a, it'll be an exciting day. It will be exciting. I think it always is. Um, I I think that's about all the time that we have. Okay. I really appreciate you coming out. As always, um, it's always a pleasure. And uh, again, that uh, spacewalk will be happening on uh, Friday. You can watch it here on NASA Television, beginning at 8:30 a.m. Central Time. Thanks so Very much good. for coming out. Thanks, Amico. Thank always you. great to be here. Thanks, everybody.